Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, I am Leah Conan. I'm the author of All the Broken People and The Perfect Escape, which is coming out in January. Um, but I am so excited tonight to virtually sit down with uh, Jessica for this awesome conversation about her book, The Lost Girls. And first, I wanted to just say thank you so much to Barbara's Bookstore for hosting this conversation between uh, myself and Jessica. And also, you know, just thank to all the indie bookstores that have kept us authors really going and kept these conversations happening all throughout the last year and a half and have just constantly adapted to like the changing needs of authors and readers and all of that. Um, and just wanted to encourage everybody to, if you want to buy uh, Jessica's book or my books, uh, please do it through Barbara's and um, support indie bookstores so we can continue to have these super fun conversations. Um, okay, so I just wanted to start off by introducing you. I'm going to go by your bio that I found on the internet, but um, okay. if you would like to add anything, you may. But uh, Jessica Chiarella is the author of The Lost Girls and And Again, which was the August 2016 Target Book Club pick. She holds an MA in writing and publishing from DePaul University and an MFA in creative writing from the University of California, Riverside. She lives in Chicago with her dog, Leia, so I'm assuming you are a Star Wars fan. Big Star um, Wars fan. Yeah. Good. All right. We can we can agree theory. on that. Yeah, we can get into that later. Definitely. Yeah, we can, you know, <laughs> talk about the new ones, you know, what we feel. Yeah. Um but first, would you I'd love to hear kind of in your words just a little bit about your book. Yeah, yeah. Well, Which first we of all, thank you so much to Barbara's for hosting. Thank you, Leah, so much for moderating. Um, you know, I feel like it's so nice, especially in these strange times, to sort of be able to come together and, you know, have interesting conversations with uh, authors that I'm a big fan of. So, yeah, everyone definitely buy Leah's book and, uh, you know, look for the pre-order for her new one. Um, but, yeah, so The Lost Girls um, is... A book that's essentially about Marty Reese, who's the protagonist. She's um, a podcaster and she sort of comes to prominence because she does a podcast about her own sister's disappearance. Her older sister disappeared when she was eight years old. Her sister was 16. Um, they were walking home from school one day together and they came upon this car in the woods and her sister let go of her hand and told her to run away. And she did. And her sister was never seen again. So she starts this podcast as a way to sort of process, you know, all of these feelings of survivor's guilt and sort of tell her sister's story so many years later, it's 20 years later. And, um, you know, and also to sort of try and drum up some attention for her sister's case that's been cold for 20 years. And uh, so she does, she, she gets some new leads through the, through the podcast. And one of the women who re reaches out to her is, a woman named Ava Vreeland, and she thinks that she has a case that's a murder case that might be connected to Marty's sister's disappearance. And that the action of the book sort of takes off from there when these two interesting women sort of team up to try to figure out, is this linkage real? You know, like what's the bigger story here? Um, and to try to vindicate this person who's been imprisoned for this murder that he you know may or may not have actually committed so um yeah it's a uh, it's basically the the jumping off point and it's amazing um it's really good you it gets right into it which i think is just so awesome about thrillers and it's super super based in character and these relationships but it still has the the plot that is like having you going and keeping you on your toes um Interestingly, my first question that I had for you is actually very similar to a question that we received from Stuart. Um, this book is a departure from your first in such a fun way. Was there something that inspired this direction? And, you know, that's also what I want to talk about. And again, is not a thriller. It seems more of like kind of a speculative uh, fiction. Mm -hmm. And so you move to a really more kind of straightforward thriller. And what was kind of the reasoning behind that? And also were thrillers something that you had always wanted to explore? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, and, you know, I feel like, yes, And Again was a speculative book. I sort of started off, you know, I've taken, I've been in a couple of graduate programs. And so you're, you're in these programs and you're sort of 
learning to write, you know, a classic short, short story, or when you get into novels, you start thinking about mainstream fiction. And even though I had all this training in how to sort of write real life as we know it, um, you know, sort of day to day real life and interpersonal relationships and the human condition and all of these like very interesting, um, you know, avenues for fiction, I was always really drawn towards stories that sort of had a twist on that, you know, so speculative fiction initially really appealed to me because I felt like, okay, this could be the real world, but something is different, you know, like there's this one element that has sort of been changed and exploring the way that people who are just regular people would sort of navigate that change. So that was and again. And, you know, I wrote that when I was in grad school and it was sort of my first go at novel writing. And then, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking, okay, you know, what do I write next? Do I write a speculative book? Do I write something that, you know, is larger in scope? You know, and I got, I, I was spinning my wheels for so long and just trying to figure out what that next book was and sort of making attempts and false starts and putting books in drawers as, you know, so many writers have the, ex the experience of doing um, that, you know, I just, I got to this place where I was like, I just want to write something that feels as fun as the fun books that I read. Mm -hmm. And what do I go to when I want to have a good time with a book? Like when I just am like, I just want to escape my life and want a book to just transport me. I go to thrillers. And so I didn't, I had never set out thinking, I, you know, I definitely want to write a thriller. Like this is, you know, hundred percent my genre, but when I, it came down to it, I was like, I just want to have fun writing. And the only thing that seemed like that made sense was writing a thriller because there's so much fun to read. I sort of grew up, you know, my family is a big Hitchcock family. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I like to joke my mom's a children's librarian, but she like, she won't read a book that doesn't have a body count these days. Yeah. I mean, just like, you know, I come from this background of just loving the genre, loving mysteries, loving procedurals, loving thrillers. And so it, it just made sense um, at that point to be like, I don't know what to write. I'm going to write something that is just going to be a good time to write and hopefully a good time to read. So, well, it's interesting. I, so I'm from a Hitchcock family as well and just grew up reading all that Agatha Christie that I could find at yeah. my tiny, tiny library mm -hmm. and Mary Higgins Clark, all that. And then, oh, yeah. you know, it was the same. I had this whole YA thing that I was doing. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, I was just realizing that what I was reading over and over again was thrillers. What I was watching was mysteries and horror and, you know, some true crime, which I totally want to get into. Um, yeah. But it is, I think a lot of people are in this position where they're moving into something just for the sheer, like, love of it. You know, like, mm -hmm. they're just like, like you said, like, I want to have fun writing this book. Um, and they are so fun. And I think a book like yours shows you that it can be really fun. And it can also tackle some really, really, really big ideas from relationships to media to, you know, to all of that. Um, I kind of wanted, like, you know, speaking of media, I wanted to see, you know, why did you decide to go the true crime podcast direction? I mean, it's such a wonderful, brilliant setup, and it really hooks you from the start. And as someone who has never been a podcaster, I totally believed it. I was like, it feels like this is how you'd make a podcast. It feels like this is how you'd have a podcast awards, you know, and all that. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd love to hear about kind of your your choices there and, and why. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, you know, for me, it sort of made sense, first of all, because I had come to, cr to true crime as a genre, mostly through podcasting. I, like, I feel like Serial was such a gateway for so many people into the world of true crime that, you know, all of the sort of, you know, things that existed in the genre that I had, you know, consumed for so long were fictional. And so I feel like, you know, Serial hit and suddenly it was this idea of these cases that are true are the really fascinating ones. Like there is something to do with you know, following an actual police investigation and being invested in real people that felt um, just exciting in a way that, you know, fiction feels exciting, but this was, you know, this was that and something new. Mm -hmm. So I feel mm -hmm. like for me, writing about a podcaster served two purposes, which was, it sort of taps into that. It's, you know, the idea of, you know, taking on this, 
sort of cultural obsession that people suddenly have, you know, that has become docuseries and, you know, like all of these podcasts and then, you know, books, you know, just cropping up everywhere that deal mm -hmm. with real cases. I mean, like Michelle McNamara's book is the first one that always comes to mind when I think of like the scariest book that I have read in the past five years was all be gone in the dark because it is true. Um, right. So there is something that kind of taps into that actual like real fear that people walk around with in their daily life. Um, but the other purpose that it served was it allowed me to have a really amateur detective, you know, somebody mm -hmm. who had no background in journalism or law or criminal justice or any of these things who, you know, was able to just step into this investigation and take it on on her own because she had a podcast. I mean, it's almost silly when you hear it framed that way that we're sort of endowing these, you know, these sort of, you know, just everyday people with the ability to investigate these cases. But when you look at kind of the track record that people in true crime have had of, you know, breaking, you know, like discovering new leads or breaking cases, it's, you know, sometimes it's the person who's just working on a passion project in their spare time who are the ones who, you know, figure it out in the end. So that, that was sort of why I wanted to frame it with the podcast frame, because it allowed her to to not have any expertise and still feel enabled to go out and, and do this um, do this investigation on her own. Yeah, and it's, did you, how did you go about, you know, writing? Cause there are some of the investigations, like she does, like it feels like almost a real investigation. Like when she goes to the prison for the first time, like it all feels very real. And how did you research that? I mean, I, I spent a lot of time talking to people that I know, um, you know, I researched all the podcast stuff with a couple of friends of mine who run a podcasting production company, and then a couple of friends who sort of do their own, um, you know, podcast, sort of just the two of them in their kitchen. So I got to see kind of both ends of the spectrum of like, this is what you would do if you're just a couple of friends recording a podcast. This is what you do if you've got a lot of money behind you. Um, you know, the criminal justice aspect of the investigation. I talked to my uncle, who's a retired cop, who, you know, has a lot of, you know, expertise in sort of what police investigations look like, what do they look for. And, you know, the rest of it was just, you know, first of all, being really into true crime myself. Mm -hmm. You know, you pick up a lot through osmosis, just watching all the documentaries and listening to all the podcasts and reading all the books. But then um, especially, particularly um, Billy Jensen's book, Chase Darkness With Me, was a huge one for me because he's one of the people who was brought on to finish I'll Be Gone in the Dark after Mac uh, Michelle McNamara tragically passed away. So mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. sort of lays out okay, if you want to be a citizen crime solver, if you want to sort of get into this world of getting on a message board at night and, you know, trying to figure out how to solve this case, here are the steps that you want to take. So his book was invaluable to me um, when I was writing it. And then I've got, you know, friends who are attorneys who have some, you know, experience in the criminal justice system. So I just kind of tapped everyone that I knew who could be helpful. And then if I couldn't get it there, I sort of, you know, relied on my... Um, you know, just obsession with true crime myself. I'm sure, uh, as I do, you have a lot of horrifying Google searches in your oh, history. Oh, God. You Seriously. know, those ones where you're like, is the every... FBI coming for me? I yeah, know people I know. are watching this. I'm on a uh, list somewhere where it's like, how deep do you have to bury a body? Like, and you just how long, it, right, like, like, how long does the body take to go cold? Like, those sorts yeah. of things. And you're just like, ooh, okay. Just horrifying. You're you know. Like, anyway sees this this is a real this is real trouble <laughs> yes uh always a lot of that always a lot of that um i wanted to uh just talk about some something that like really stood out to me which i felt was almost like the theme of the whole book is right at the beginning um when she when marty is at this podcasting award ceremony and you know this like guy with money or whatever comes up and says everyone loves a dead girl people eat that shit up and I loved it because I just thought I mean first I thought it was I mean it is accurate like that is very true and you have this character who's kind of like soulless saying it so I thought that was a really smart choice but also it's kind of like you know it kind of pokes 
like a little criticism at like the very thing you are doing, you know? And mm. I think we all kind of struggle with this, right? I think people who enjoy true crime and enjoy thrillers and and people who write them and create them, it's like, where is the line, I guess, between like, getting enjoyment out of something that that actually happened or you know or even fictionally like that is just kind of horrific and based on things that do happen to real people and I guess like I'd love to just kind of hear you know your thoughts on that because I I felt from reading the book that you did have a lot of thoughts on that and they were kind of like you know coming through yeah yeah you know it's it's interesting because it does feel contradictory in some ways and it did even feel that way sort of writing the book because you know I'd I can't tell you how many times I've had this conversation with people where it's like, oh, yeah, it's another book about a missing girl. You know, oh, it's a missing mm -hmm. sister, you know, that sort of thing. Before I sat down to write one and I was like, oh, God, the sister's got to be missing. Right. I mean, it was just. It, and you do kind of feel like. You know, is this sort of just a continuation of this trend that we've seen that, you know, just fridges women characters where it's like, mm -hmm. you know, they only, they're only characters, they're only there to be killed or to be disappeared. And I think I, you know, I set out to write in this book, hopefully a book that, you know, doesn't allow the fallout from that sort of fundamental central story of this missing sister um, to be glossed over. I mean, the, the younger sister here is really, traumatized in a way that has ruined her life. And I think that's kind of the the chord that I used to, you know, like move through this book, which was, it's not about, okay, you know, the sister goes missing and that's the exciting, the inciting incident that like, you know, starts all of the drama. It's like the sister mm -hmm. goes missing. And as a result, this protagonist has, you know, this trauma that she simply cannot get away from. And her life has been you know, twisted in ways that she herself has been an agent in, but, you know, is directly tied to the fact that she survived this incident and her sister disappeared. And so, you know, I think for me, I've been trying to unpack it for a long time and I've been, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on it as well, because the thing that I think draws us to true crime, or at least draws me to true crime in particular, is this idea that we get to unpack these stories that used to be so glossed over. You know, mm -hmm. it used to be, you know, the the evening news would have a 30 second sound bite about the latest kidnapping or the latest murder or, you know, child abduction or all of these things. And that was all you got. And then the thing about true crime that felt so compelling was that finally you got to hear who the person was and, you know, what was their life like and who was their, you know, who, loved them and who you know who did they mm -hmm. love and like it gave me a much bigger perspective on these things that used to be just categorized based on what crime they were um and suddenly it felt like these were people and they had lives and their stories mattered and it was you know the the idea that true crime gives you such a deep dive into these cases that would be 30 second sound bites otherwise feels like you know, they, they allow us to empathize more with the people involved and, you know, and, and sort of take a take a higher view of the problems within, you know, our media environment and our criminal justice system. And so I feel like in writing the book, it was it was a way to try to wrap my arms around all of those feelings and try to have a central character that would feel all of that very acutely, that there are huge problems in the criminal justice system. There are huge problems in the way that privilege drives who gets attention when they disappear and who doesn't that, you know, would have survivor's guilt and, you know, have huge personal emotional fallout from a crime that occurred within her family. And then, you know, is also, just you know a story with a good plot and an investigation and like two badass women okay. so they're I'm just gonna oh, let yeah. my dog in the room he's trying to absolutely no, knows no, no. knows through we definitely, out, uh, buddy. have the have the dog the, you know, issues here well, so the I totally dog get trying it. to nose into the room um oh yeah we love dog friends um, but, but yeah, yeah i would be interested to hear your perspective on that too because i feel like any woman writing you know thrillers sort of has to deal with that you know like who are the victims and like how you know they can't 
always be men you know like we can't right. always just be killing yeah. men in our lives, right yeah but we can and it can be very fun but we as can. Well. Yeah. um no i mean i totally it's something that i've thought a lot about myself both as a reader and as a writer and i think i think what you said about empathy is really important and i think like who the story is centering is also really important so like i think when i do like the like Michelle McNamara, I think is like such a good example because it was her writing and her reporting and all the investigation was so like honest and true to like what had happened. And it wasn't just sensationalizing it. So we could kind of like, you know, get these popcorn eating moments out of other people's trauma. Like I didn't, you know, and I think there are a lot of true crime writers and documentary filmmakers who are handling it well and then and then sometimes you do see things where it really is you know centered on the assailant or you know and i you know in your book really does like kind of handle that as well and and nod to to that when the men are centered in these stories of of predominantly women who are going missing uh so I mean, I'm like, you. I think it's a complicated thing. And I think it's just something that you have in the back of your head when you're reading and when you're writing. And I definitely have put down true crime books before, especially what, especially some of the older ones, like in the 80s, written in the 80s and 90s, yeah. that did just feel like, oh, even if they were telling the story of the woman, it was in such a way that was stereotyping or archetyping or relying a lot on you know, just basically turning it into this kind of Hollywood thing so we could demonize her or villainize her or give reasons for why she deserved to, you know, you know, why she wasn't the good girl or whatever. Yeah. Coming, yeah. Exactly. And I think that it's just something that we're thinking about. And it's like, yeah, I feel it too when I'm writing, like you don't want to put violence against women in there just in a way to just throw it in as a plot point right and you know i think that's what pe some people have reacted to in some you know movies and tv shows where it feels like you know who are created by men and they're just throwing in these extra things and it's like you know i think that is hard but i i think in your book what is interesting is that yes it is about the missing sister but it's also i mean everything is centered on the women you know it's not just marty it's ava it's like it feels always that they are the ones in charge i mean even the fact that marty's partner in the podcast is is a friend and also a woman like i feel that you did do a lot of work to kind of really to center you know women's grief and trauma and even you know and i think that's interesting too even with the the situation of colin who is you know has been accused or convicted of this murder um without giving too much away but is and is in prison it's like it's not really from his perspective it's from ava's perspective it's it's from the perspective of someone who is who is feeling as a, a sister mm -hmm. you know this other kind of thing so that's what i thought was so fascinating was that you have basically these two different sister relationships and both of them are trying to be a good sister and mm -hmm. can they can they do that together is it an opposing thing are they on you know are they enemies are they are they working together and, and you know i think that's part of what the book explores and tries to unpack yeah definitely and i think you know and i think that's one of the interesting things about true crime you know and like being a fan of true crime as a woman which is mm -hmm. you know you're experiencing it and sort of, you know, from a safe distance, from a, you know, a comfortable remove, but at the same time, you're still internalizing so much of it, you know, mm -hmm. and I feel like there, you know, there are these podcasts that you listen to and, you know, who are, re that are recommending, you know, like every woman having a file for like, if I go missing, like, here's the code for my phone and here's how you can track me. And, wow. and, you know, I've thought about like, is this something that I should be doing? You know, should I be like giving somebody the password to my computer just to, and so it's like, as much as you're, you know, involved in it, you know, as entertainment, it's still having an impact, even just on the most casual viewer. And so I feel like for women who existed within this system, you know, for women who had been touched personally by, 
you know, the criminal justice system and violence against other women in their lives, that would be sort of blown up to the nth degree. I mean, it wouldn't mm -hmm. just be walking around thinking, should I have, this, you know, should someone have this, you know, the, the code to my phone just in case? Mm -hmm. It would be like, this can touch anyone's life at any point. And how do you move through a sometimes hostile world and deal with that? And I feel like, yeah, both of them are trying to grapple with these issues in their families, you know, these siblings that they have lost in different ways who have been sort of taken away from them in different ways. And, you know, I feel like that is just, you know, my best imagining of what it would be like to be a little closer to something like this. And it's, you know, it's a hard headspace to be in. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's also the stuff of, exciting writing as well which is kind of the other of course because it's you know it's a challenge it's really really getting into yeah a situation that you know i'm assuming you have not experienced firsthand uh yeah. so you know it's like i feel like that's where the fun and the challenge is mm -hmm. um before we get too much more into my other questions on the book i just did want to make sure to get in some of these questions from uh people who are watching so sydney is asking did you consider alternate endings or did you know who'd done it from the start oh that's a great question thank you sydney um no i knew from the start who did it and it's actually a really interesting story because when i set out to write this book i definitely called in some help from a writer friend because you know i was like all right you know i've never written a thriller you know like i need help with this this idea of knowing the ending usually you know i'd have all this experience writing where you just come up with a concept and sort of mm -hmm. write mm -hmm. until your characters do things and then sort of like try to push them in different directions but like see where you're gonna end up and this i was like i know this has to have plot i know it needs to you know unfold in a certain way there needs to be red ha herrings there needs to be twists so my friend matt actually uh was very kind and sat down in numerous Chicago dive bars with me to sort of hash out, okay, you know, this is what, like, this is what a plot looks like. This is how it needs to unfold. You know, these are sort of the, the different turns. And I had some mm -hmm. screenwriting um, as well in my, in my background. So I feel like once I sort of got that in my head, the story unfolded in a way that seemed very logical to me. I sort of always knew what I wanted that final twist to be for those who have read the book. Um, and so I was always kind of writing towards that. It was just about sort of filling in, okay, what happens along the way and how do I allow it to unfold in a way that that, that final twist will feel earned? Um, so yeah, I always kind of knew from the start how it would end and it was all about working in that direction. And it is like finding, you know, this is something that I deal with in my books as well. It's like finding it so it feels very earned and it doesn't feel like so much of a surprise that it's out of left field, but it still feels surprising, you know? So you don't want, and it, cause I know we've all experienced this, you read a book and, and you find out who the killer is or, or at the movie, you know, at the movies, whatever. And, and it's just so, you're like, I didn't even remember that character, you know, it's so yeah, out of left yeah. field. But then on the other hand, you have to me, like the perfect feeling is when you, you figure out that final twist and then you look back and you're like, oh, oh my goodness, how did I not see it? Like it was here mm -hmm. and there and you kind of like flash back through the book and just like rethink all these things that have been yeah. seeded. And I think, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to like, I props to your friend Matt because it is hard to like kind of explain how to do that or even understand yourself how to do it. And I feel like I'm figuring out more and more with every book and every draft. Mm -hmm. Um, cause it is this like careful balance. And I think especially thriller readers are so smart and they see oh stuff God. coming. Yeah. On it. yeah. They are so on it. So yeah. yeah, the bar is just so high because the readers are just amazing. Um, actually, I did want to ask you, um, because you've got such a background in YA and then moved over to thrillers, what was your, like, did your writing process change as a result of that? Yeah. So I had to... I guess the process didn't change. Like I was always, um, I was always a plotter with YA as well. And I always had to, even though my outline changes throughout and like mm -hmm. with new drafts, I definitely have to rework some things. But I 
definitely had to write the all the broken people like three times to like figure okay. it out. Like I just mm -hmm. replotted that thing multiple times. I did change I did change a lot of the the reveals and the details. Yeah, yeah. Because I was just learning how to write a mystery, which was just so it was so different. Um mm -hmm. so I felt like and people ask me that a lot. People actually ask Oh, is the process different from YA to adult? And I'm like, no, not at all. But the genre, like I was mm -hmm. writing YA romance and romance to thriller, it's just like, whoa, way different. I mean, and you still, like a lot of it applies, right? Like learning about pacing and a slow burn and like, you know, you need in a romance and anything, you need these, you know, moments and cliffhangers and twists. But on a thriller in the, especially a traditional like whodunit it's like it's just like another level of thinking um mm -hmm. and surprise that I feel like you have to kind of infuse into mm -hmm. into your books and it's it's not easy <laughs> yeah because it's like you know I think about writing romance and it's like you sort of know who your players are you know it's like you're writing you do yeah illusions. it's you like do. you're trying and we all, to and you all, it but you all know I mean every romance writer and reader we know we know going in what's going to happen we know yeah. they're going to get together we're just we want to see how and how long mm -hmm. and like what is going to happen and all that but yeah with thrillers it's like you're like you really don't know and i yeah. think that's like the fun of it for reading it and, and for writing it and you know like as writers i feel like half the time we don't know either so it's like we're right there along yeah. with you just doing it a little well, sooner the, that's the funny thing about thrillers where it feels like you know you're you're sort of setting up the same kind of relationship right there's the investigator mm -hmm. and then there's the perpetrator sure. and you're sort of like working towards this point where the two of them will converge but you've got to keep one's entire existence away from the audience so like yes. what a bizarre like what a bizarre shift to make there it like, is what strange a, i always have yeah. pages and pages of backstory that like don't ever get into oh, yeah. you know it's just like all these things that happen like before the book starts and it's just like mm -hmm. it's like a whole other timeline you know you're like yeah oh crazy. yeah um, that's that's so much of the fun right it is it really is um i did want to talk about uh because i thought it was so interesting and so well handled that you know you have marty as this um really well off uh white woman and her sister uh obviously is also white and and comes from this suburban extremely elite and privileged community and i know the book alludes to it um that you know many other murders or or disappearances especially of you know women of color are not being given the same um the same press that that her sister got and so i was just you know i've been thinking about it a lot just with everything that um has happened with this gabby petito disappearance yeah. which like on the one hand you know her story of course deserves to be told and it is good that you know people are paying attention and we're not just letting it go and you know all of that but then on the other hand you do you know you see these especially, you know, like indigenous women and, you know, these people who things are happening to and we're not hearing about it at all. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that my question to you is, why did you decide to, to create, you know, a character of such privilege and of such wealth? And why did you kind of approach it from that way? And, and how do you think her privilege really affects kind of how things unfold for the investigation and the book? Yeah, that's really, that's a really interesting question. And I really appreciate it. I think it came from a place of, I guess, living in Chicago for long enough. I mean, it's, 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 you kind of feel it in your bones when you live here that there are these disparate experiences that people mm -hmm. can have just based on which neighborhood they're from, what they look like, what their socioeconomic status is. And so for me, it felt like, this this had to be a story of like the pretty blonde rich girl mm -hmm. getting all of the attention mm -hmm. and because that felt so true to sort of the way that things work around here and in other places obviously as well you know nationally as well like again there are so many cases of white women getting so much attention 
while there's so much violence against women of color that is just completely ignored by the media. And so I feel I felt like setting it up so that her sister would have every advantage and that she also has every advantage. You know, she's from the same privileged background. Mm -hmm. She has this trauma and her family sort of falls apart as a result of her sister's disappearance, but she still has plenty of advantages in life. And the idea that it, it was kind of a way to a lot, like let the trauma pull her under regardless of all of her advantages, but also then to set up this, this tension in which she herself, because she's ex obsessed with her sister's case, knows that she is also part of the problem. You know, she, mm -hmm. she has this awareness that she is not shining this spotlight of their podcast onto other cases because she can't get away from the question of what her sister, of what happened to her sister. So I feel like it, it, it you know, it's, it implicates her as being part of the problem while simultaneously, I guess, demonstrating how her trauma keeps that from ever not being the case. Like the, until she's got an answer, she might never be able to shine that spotlight on anyone but her sister um, to everyone's detriment. And I think, I mean, I think that's really interesting about the whole setup of the book is it's not, it, it reminded me a, a lot and this, I mean this in the absolute best way of um, in, in the woods, the first ton of French book. Yeah, thank you. Because, you know, it's following this detective who is investigating this thing that happened to him when he, you know, people went, kids went missing and he was in the woods and he can't remember this. And, and I mean, I'm always, I always love an investigation when someone has a personal kind of thing invested in it. And I think that, that's what was so interesting to me is like, you pick it up and you're like, okay, it's going to be about a podcast and true crime. And you kind of expect that. And then when you see that it is so personal and that the whole idea of the podcast just came from, you know, her friend being like, let's just record your reactions to this, you know, this wild thing that is happening to you. I think that makes it so personal. Um, and just one thing I want to touch on was kind of how you explored memory, because a lot of different characters talk about memory in the book. So you have Colin, who's like, I, you know, I think she was wearing this dress, but then they told me she wasn't. And you have Marty, obviously, who keeps going back to this memory. And I think, you know, we've all read that, that memories change and evolve. And the more times you, every time you kind of go back to them, they do change. So I guess, what drew you to that you know like is is that something you kind of have always wanted to explore or just i'd love to just hear more about that because i felt like the way you handled it was very you know kind of nuanced thank you yeah you know i feel like that was like the idea of memory really sort of grabbed me while i was writing and again my first book because there was all of this research about how the sense of smell was tied to memory. And so like in my, okay, you know, these, and again, it's basically about people who get fully new bodies and sort of lose their sense memories, and their muscle memories from their old bodies. And so it, for me, that really took hold. And I was like, they would not have so much of their memories because like these smells wouldn't be imprinted on them in the same way that they would have before. And so jumping off from that in reading and doing so much research in terms of true crime and about, you know, actual cases, um, for me, it was, it was like the thing that I sort of struck me so much was how unreliable, un like I was eyewitness testimony is because people's memories tend to change. So there are so many people who would witness the same event who would give you slightly different, um, you know, accounts of what happened, what someone was wearing, their height, their weight, you know, exactly how things unfolded based on the just fallibility of human memory. So for me, my sort of already existing kind of obsession in the way that memory is, you know, stored in the way that memory comes out, mixed with this idea that people are using this fallible, you know, record as a way of determining guilt and innocence in criminal cases 
just felt like, okay, now I've got all of this, you know, to play with in this book where, you know, she's try she feels like she is the sole witness to her sister's kidnapper and she simply cannot remember even what color the car was and how that would feel and how badly you would want to just conjure something just to feel like it's real, you know, just to feel like you can be helpful. So for me, yeah, it just felt like memory is such a strange phenomenon. Like you were saying how it can change based on if you just recall a memory too many times, you will be altering it just based on your preconceived notions of what you remembered or if someone describes it to you, it can change. So yeah, the idea that we lean so hard on eyewitness testimony in criminal justice circles is incredible to me based on what I've read and researched on it. But also, yeah, I just wanted to sort of touch on that in the book that, you know, our lives are sort of, you know, create this narrative that we constantly reinforce through thinking back on our memories in particular ways. And um, yeah, I think that's just. Well, and you think one, about it too, like mm -hmm. if you were Marty and you were asked to see all these, you know, mugshots or whatever, like how, how it would all just kind of turn to soup in your brain. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you had just seen it the day before in a flash and like, she's going back so many years, mm -hmm. you know, and, but then at the same time, what I think is compelling about the character is like, you believe why she would just be like, if I could just remember it better, this yeah. would, you know, this would help yeah. everything. She's the linchpin in it. She's like, yeah, if I could just out. like I'm the one I was there I saw him I saw the car if I could just unlock this you know room in my mind that has actually stored the correct information I could fix it and yet we know that it's much easier to influence people into giving the wrong information than it is to ever truly remember what happened absolutely um, I want to make sure we get to all our questions so what is next for you are there any new projects on the horizon Yes, there are two actually that I'm working Ooh. on. Yeah, simultaneously right now. Right. I mean, aside from, so just novel projects, I guess I'll, I'll focus on because there's also a lot of exciting other things, you know, in the workings in, you know, different areas. But um, I'm working on finishing up revisions on sort of the book that I've been carrying around for about eight years now, which was my MFA thesis. It's this multi-generational speculative slash historical novel about um, the, this family in Chicago where the women can see imminent death by touching people. And so it's just like, it. it's in like Chicago in the 1930s and Chicago in the 1980s and just like, yeah. So I just, I'm, I'm working on revision for that. And so that is very, very exciting for me because it feels like it's been a long time coming and I've just been yeah. working on forever. Um, but then I'm also starting a fun new thriller about um, these uh, this woman who's like a, a teaching assistant in the 1970s who goes to Europe with the professor that she's working for and ends up falling in love with this shipping magnate in Rome. And they sort of run off together and then intrigue and, you know, like interesting international political shadiness happens and sort of things spiral from there so i feel like so just a couple of fun shadiness happens is a good just tagline for just thrillers in general like shadiness yeah. is going to happen i um, mean it just feels like trust me there will be interesting shit <laughs> like <laughs> things will go down yes um okay matt has a great question too what were some of your influences writing lost girls and who did you read for inspiration Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, the influences, you know, I, I would say, aside from all of the true crime podcasts and shows, I mean, like the, just the jinx, making a murderer, serial, cold, like all of the like really, really big ones, I feel like I tried to draw from in this, but then books, you know, I always come back to Gillian Flynn as like, the platonic I ideal of how to write a thriller. And so I feel like she always looms so large in my consciousness when I sit down to write. But then, I mean, I read a lot of Karen Slaughter when I was working on this. I read, you know, a lot of uh, Lisa Gardner, Mary Kubica. I mean, there were just like so many books that sort of helped me figure out 
the the sort of tenets of the genre since I was new to it. You know, I'd been such an avid reader, but had never written in it. It was like going back to the books that I'd read before, feeling like, okay, now I need to not only just enjoy them, but I need to draw from them the marks that I need to hit, the things that I need to look for, you know? And so, yeah, those were, those were big ones, I would say. Well, I think, you know, since you mentioned Gillian, like Dark Places is such an interesting kind of compliment or your book is such a nice compliment to dark places because that's what I loved about I think that was the first book I read of hers and that I just love this idea of like a, a woman who had been through all this stuff in childhood and it had like completely defined her life and that's what I think you see in Marty um and something oh I did want to ask really quickly also you know we have a few minutes left so if anyone else wants to toss in um some questions um please do. But I did want to ask you, um, like, I love that you just had Marty like blow up her life and blow up her marriage. And I was wondering kind of like the background of that and why you chose to go there, because you definitely could have written this novel where, you know, she did have kind of like a healthy relationship or even a not healthy relationship, but you kind of gave her something that she really loved. And just let her just destroy it out of this trauma and grief. And I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think one of my favorite types of story is, you know, the person who is given every advantage and sort of can't get out of their own way for one reason or another. Um, sometimes it's incredibly frustrating and I would not blame anyone for being incredibly frustrated with Marty for some of the choices that she makes in this book. But there's something about being in a place in your life where you realize that you've made all the choices that you should have made and you're on a track that most people would want to be on as marty was and just you know feel like there's something else looming that's sort of keeping you up at night that is is going to take you away from all of that but it's something that simply can't be resisted and it's it's interesting because i've thought a lot about marty in relation to kind of where i was in my life when i started writing this book because you know i was in you know a a decent job and you know sort of on a track and trying to you know live correctly and make all the right choices and there was a part of me that was just like but writing you know, writing was always the thing that was like, that would not let me go. And so I feel so strongly about Marty and I feel so much affection for Marty because it's sort of the same thing that I did was like, reject this sort of traditional, you know, like good girl way of, you know, like ordering my life and turning towards this thing that, you know, you shouldn't want to, to hang your life on, which is just like, life is a writer, which is, you know, at times not a picnic. So yeah, it, it just, for me, I think it just felt not only like kind of a story that I loved um, to capture, but also it felt very close to kind of where I was, which is really desiring to blow up my life at that time by sort of going all in on, on not And what writing. were you doing before? I was working at the University of Chicago in the law school. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, just a communications position. So just like, so it was like you know, a very like stable track. Stable, yeah, very yeah. stable. You know, like good, good team of people. Met a lot of amazing friends there, who I think are some of which are here tonight. Um, but also, you know, just in my core, not the thing that you know I wanted to spend the next thirty years of my life doing. So yeah, I mean, it just it did feel like, oh, wow, I'm making this really, really sideways choice. Um, that yes. sometimes, I mean, you, when know, you If you crave stability, you go into fiction writing. That is- Yeah, just, oh, totally. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, best, best uh, life plan ever. We, we all find our ways. Uh, yeah. the, the path is very winding. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing that I've noticed between a more traditional path is just like usually you're going in one direction and maybe you have some setbacks but you still kind of kind of going in one direction and and writing is like fiction is just like you know like you're here and then you're here and then you're here mm -hmm. but, totally but you know that's why we keep writing books and keep putting stuff out there yeah um, 
but yeah, this has been, it's been awesome talking. I just wanted to give one more chance for if anyone else has any questions for Jessica or me, um, toss them into the little ask a question button at the bottom. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I love, love the book. I think there's, you know, there's so many thrillers out there now and they're so, they're all so much fun, but it's always really great to read one that is just so deeply rooted in character and, and into these sort of like female relationships, I think, um, that really drive the characters in your book. So, so yeah, it was, uh, it's, it's, yeah really awesome and just exciting and i'm sure you know we all can't wait to see uh your this next thriller that has international intrigue and shady stuff happening as well shady stuff happening. well i'm so excited about your next book thank you again so much um for being in conversation with me tonight this has been lovely and uh yeah thank you to barbara's books for hosting everybody support independent bookstores support barbara's books and uh yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for turning out and for your questions and for participating. Yes, thank you, Barbara's Bookstore. This has been so much fun. And um, hopefully there will just be loads more conversations like this continuing to happen because independent bookstores are awesome. So please support Barbara's and uh, other independent stores. Uh, thank you so much, Jessica. And thank you for everyone who attended. And um, I think that's all. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone.